and we're live. Welcome back to another episode of the iFilmmaker podcast. My name is Ariel Martinez. Today we have a great episode for you guys. I'm very excited about this one. Before we get to that, just want to remind you guys that we are live on our YouTube channel over at the iFilmmaker podcast YouTube channel. That's uh, youtube.com slash iFilmmaker. Uh, make sure you're subscribed and you have that notification turned on because this is very sporadic. This is very sporadic. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a full-time filmmaker, so I don't dedicate a specific time of the week to do this. So just stay notified. Every time we go live, I try my best to keep you guys notified and trying to uh, send out those ads out there so you guys can see when we're going to go live. But either way, it stays on there, so you can always check it out after. Today we have a great episode. As I said, we have the great Sean Kennel with us. And uh, he's going to be sharing some awesome knowledge on business and growth and whatnot. So I don't want to take too much time. So just a quick introduction. Sean Cano is a YouTube YouTuber. If you guys don't know who he is, uh, which I'd be very surprised if you didn't. YouTuber, international speaker, and a coach. And he helps entrepreneurs build their influence and their income with online video, which is fantastic. He is also a best-selling author. He has a great book out and he's also listed in the top 20 or in the 20 must watch YouTube channels that will change your business uh, by Forbes. So that's quite a nice list to be on. Uh, Sean, how are you? Ariel, I'm fired up and super grateful to be on the podcast. Man, I'm so happy to have you here on the podcast. We So we met over at NAB this year. Awesome. I met a lot of people. You're one of the top ones there that I was excited to meet. I was kind of a fanboy over there when I when I saw you. I'm like, man, I got to go say hi and go uh, meet you. How was NAB for you, by the way? Love NAB, one of our favorite shows. Um, you know, we pumped out a lot of content, but actually CES this year was a whole nother level for us. We did really? 29 videos in the four days. Wow. And these were like proper, like thought through title. I mean, covering gear, but we also did some interview. We did like just a lot of content, but I love NAB and CES because for content creators, mm. it's like a dreamland. That's awesome. That's sick. So um, one thing I forgot to mention about you, Think Media. That's 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 your oh, yeah. your, your business. That's right. And that's the main channel. Yeah, that's right. That's the Think Media. So tell me a little bit about Think Media. What is it? What are you what is it that you're providing? Yeah, Think Media, our tagline is the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And so the promise there is weekly tools videos. So that's the gear for creators. As a tech channel, I'm definitely like a tech reviewer, tech channel. But I'm not covering really like the latest smartphone or 3D printers or smart home technology. I'm covering cameras, lighting. And, and to be honest, I'm actually not even covering as much filmmaker stuff. Mm -hmm. We're not covering like Zacuto rigs and follow focuses. We're covering the tools for kind of your modern day, if you will, like soccer mom, aspiring YouTuber, beauty guru, entrepreneur, like accountant that knows they need to be creating content. Um, and that was interesting. You know, I, I my background is film and was shooting weddings and, and doing some of those things. But um, I, I really saw an opportunity to serve almost like the average person that's not obsessing over like 422 color or 444, like capturing to Ninja Atomos, you know, like, but just like someone who needs like a flippy screen and can like tap their face and focus. So that's kind of like the technology side that we cover there. And then we cover the strategy side as our main brand. Um, how is it you get more views, grow your influence on platforms, monetize online. I love talking to freelancers because I think there's so much opportunity for photographers, videographers, filmmakers that are going out, getting paid to shoot content, you know, getting paid to edit and shoot that to all to start creating content online and create leverage and extra income by doing things like affiliate marketing. And that was really my story. Mm. So I think media started in 2010, very unclear, kind of just putting some videos out in my spare time, didn't do much, but I did put a video out here and there, depending if I had some time for about five years, but in the last three is when it really exploded and uh, we should be hitting a million subscribers in just a short time. Come on. That's awesome. So to almost 10 years now, since you started think media, it's 2019, no yeah. it's about yeah, to be 10 exactly. years. Wow. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. 
and you guys have been growing great. I, I think I did hear about you guys for the first time a few years ago when you said it started really growing. What do you think? What do you think made that that growth happen the the past three years? Well, the first thing was I've learned that in order to succeed on YouTube, you have to upload videos on YouTube. That's a very good concept, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean. <laughs> Like, and, and I mean it though, I mean, you mentioned, Hey, uh, you know, go check out the stream. It's kind of inconsistent. It's a, yeah. it's, it's the foundation. I mean, I really think, tell me, yeah, you have to be putting out consistent content. Sure. Now I get it. Um, I have had, a, I had a full-time job. I worked at a church full-time as like the creative director and was doing a lot of creative media there. And so time was limited, but mm -hmm. when the channel started blowing up was when I started uploading videos. Here's the thing. I actually had the knowledge. Like I knew mm -hmm. how to rank videos. I'm passionate about SEO, yeah. uh, optimizing our videos. So they rank in search. Think Media gets 2,000 to 2,500 views every 60 minutes, whether I upload new videos or not, because there's a library of ranked videos mm -hmm. that get views while you snooze. People search for a topic. They find my video. Even though I made it a year and a half ago, they're sure. watching it right now as right. we are doing this podcast. So I actually knew how to do that. I just wasn't deploying it consistently. And this actually might be interesting for your audience. October, 2015 was when everything changed for me. And I was kind of doing think media, uh, here and there, I, I, video influencers that actually started. And I was kind of doing it with Benji, but I had, I was making money off freelance clients. I was making a few hundred dollars a month off of affiliate marketing and YouTube ads. Um, but nothing super significant I, during the holidays of even probably like the end of even the end of 20 or no, the end of 2014, maybe got close to like a grand because the holidays always go up on affiliate marketing off the Amazon program when you talk about tech and cameras. Mm. But all I have to say, October 2015 rolls around and I get a call. I have three main freelance clients. One was paying me two grand a month, two were paying me two grand a month, one was paying me one grand a month, 5K a month, 60K a year, and then some side income. Um, my wife just helps me in the business, living in Las Vegas as entrepreneurs, medical bills, all that stuff's on us, you know, insurance. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was kind of like chilling. I was like, great, pretty good income, scaling this online thing, but like kind of comfortable with my mm -hmm. freelance clients. I was doing social media management, a little bit of YouTube shooting, editing and uploading for them. And what happened was first week, one of them calls me, hey, uh, you know what? It's not working out. We got to let you go. Mm. Dang, $2,000 down. You know what though? I yeah. still got a base. I could refill that slot. Second week, Ariel. Hey, uh, you know what, Sean? Another call comes in. We uh, hired some people and we're not going to do contractors anymore. We got to let you go. Now I'm like, oh. okay, that that's that's a blow. That's two in a row. But yeah. then God is my witness, man. Week three, yo, Sean, um, we got to let you go. So in three weeks, three weeks back to back. Oh my we lost gosh. Like 80 to 90% of our monthly income. So I spent the fourth week um, depressed watching Netflix and eating Ben and Jerry's <laughs> like boom chocolate, like the core one. I can yeah, that's the good one. I myself, <laughs> it's the whole week I was like, dude, this is a this is a blow, man. But uh, I called my mentor, David mm -hmm. Goldstein, one of my mentors, just in business. And I was like, I'm kind of worried. I'm like losing all his clients. He goes, I'm not worried. Now he's like independently wealthy, and yeah. I'm like. I'm like, that's the most offensive thing I've ever heard you say. Of course you're not worried, but David, last time I checked, you don't pay our rent. And so, but I was actually really glad he said that because he's like, look, you know, as an entrepreneur, eventually you need to jump off the cliff, mm. uh, but you just got kicked off the cliff, homie. Like it's time to run. So yeah. starting November 1st, um, 2015, I, you know, mustered my energy. I punched discouragement in the face. And I just started going all in, but I was pumped. I And here's why. For the first time in my life, no more bosses, no mm. freelance clients. So I had like three bosses with three freelance clients. Sure. And like, and I've done a lot of client work, but man, I like not doing it because I like to just have no boss. And, and yeah. so even though we didn't really have the money yet, I was like, dude, this is crazy. All I got to do is wake up every day and make videos. And because I knew how to rank videos, I 16, uh, Think Media had 16,000 subscribers. Okay. Super active because I was kind of here and there. But this like is 2015, it. right? 2015, October, November 1st now. 16,000 okay. subscribers, but I go all in. And I was working like 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I've never been intimidated by hard work. Uh, it's kind of how my mm -hmm. parents raised, raised me. Um, I, I, I don't, I think that there's a bunch of weird stuff with like hustle porn and like hustler culture. I don't even care. 
I just work hard, man. I just, I, I like what I do. Come and on. I just learned that like where, what I don't have in talent, I can make up and outworking people. And mm. so I just started to grind and, and I put out as many videos as I could maximizing black Friday, cyber Monday and holiday shopping. And by mm. January 1st, um, 2016, the, we were making like 4,500 off the Amazon associates program. YouTube ads was probably another 500 and I had replaced Jeez. that freelance income. Um, and I think media was at 20,000 subs, but then, and it's been like Christmas every, every since I have a boss, man, it's like every single day I just wake up with like glowing gratitude. That's not to say there's not hard days, sure. but like, um, I'm just super grateful. And so then from there it was pure hustle, just kept it going, scaling income. And, 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 and actually for a moment, I kind of went through like a quarter life crisis. Cause I was like, dude, this is my dream. I'm like, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> I, I, I'm working from home. I'm making enough money to live on for me and my wife. And I actually kind of had a, a struggle because I had my vision had to grow up. I mean, when I, I come from a small town, I'm a college dropout. I come from a small town, an hour north of Seattle. Nobody in my family did like, uh, you know, media or was any of these things. Nobody really had like a lifestyle business where it was like highly leveraged. And mm. so I was like this, I had accomplished and, 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 and not a lot of people in my family, you know, making six figure incomes or whatever. So it was like, um, Wow. I, everything I thought was like the peak at 21, I just mm -hmm. hit, which actually led me to a, a little bit of celebration, a little bit of like comfort and resting in it. And then a little bit of like, well, what the heck is next? Mm. So I had to capture a bigger vision to keep the hustle going. And that, that was a vision to really impact the world and build a movement and build like a company and build a team. And right now I feel like we're kind of building like the Wu-Tang clan of tech because we oh, got man. media doing like, you know, Heather Torres and Omar El Takori and Nolan yeah. Mulf. And so, um, that's sort of, that's sort of our heart, but that, that was sort of the journey, man. It's been crazy. That's fantastic, man. What a phenomenal story. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, so you, you answered a lot of my first initial <laughs> questions in there, man. Um, so let, let's move on to like, I guess looking at a business, right? Uh, how do you assess what a business needs? What are some of the first things that you look at? And again, and and you know what? I know I knew that you like obviously you're not 100% focused on filmmaking. You're 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 focused on businesses in general and and helping businesses grow using um, video content. And you know I, I think that this is still very valuable information, whether it's a filmmaker, freelance filmmaker like myself or the next person that's trying to start, open up a business to, to sell some shoes, whatever it is. Um, so with that being said, what are the first things that you assess when you kind of evaluate someone's business and you kind of see uh, if their model is working, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, it's probably a couple categories. Like, let's mm -hmm. talk about freelance first. In okay. 2009, I started a business called clear vision media where I was doing video production for local small businesses, weddings, uh, for people and things like that. And I think that somebody that really wants to maximize online video could use YouTube as a way to kind of showcase your work and your por portfolio, but you should also leverage search. And here's an example. If you go to YouTube and you type in Bellingham, Washington wedding, um, as well as a few other keywords, my video should be ranking number one on my clear vision channel years later. And what happened was it was at this, I forget the hotel name, Bellingham, Washington, which is like an, uh, two hours North of Seattle, Washington. And I did a wedding video for a client, but the way I positioned it was so people could discover it from a search standpoint. And it led to all this inbound traffic because people that were getting hotel bellwether people that were getting married at the hotel bellwether were finding the video seeing seeing the output that i did and then wanting me to hire hire me to do the same thing so i was getting countless emails and leads if you will for my business so i mean i think it's always about starting with the end in mind in how you're going to use social media and youtube what is it you want to happen do you want more leads do you want to book more weddings or high end clients and then thinking about how you could create content and even position for with YouTube search-based content that could lead to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Now, you know, with with all that that you just mentioned, how does quality of video play 
into, I guess, and, and I know that quality is a very, um, it's hard to kind of find a standard depending who you're talking to, right? Like uh, somebody that has never worked with video, the quality is different to them than it is to, to, to you know, someone like you or myself, you know? Um, how do you kind of explain that to people? Yeah, it depends on your niche. For you, it's everything because yeah. you better be legit, right? <laughs> but, but for the uh, business owner, I don't actually think it matters that much. Now, the mm -hmm. three things that matter, AVL, audio, video, lighting, People need to be able to see you. They need to be able to hear you. But like your smartphone is good enough. Absolutely. Because it's, I agree. it's the content value, not the production value. Let me mm -hmm. add another thing too. If sure. you want to have a business model, if I'm a freelancer, I'm if, and I want, here's the thing to like, if you love what you're doing, you love client work, you're having fun. Why even use social media? I mean, like why even add more drama in your life? You don't need political views filling your feed all day long and causing you stress. You don't need to get addicted to your phone and have dopamine, you know, you don't need that. <laughs> but, but if you see what's happening in the world, you see the relevance of social media, you see that this is where things are going. You have bigger ambitions than what you're doing now. And you want to increase leverage. What do I mean? Mm -hmm. You recognize that I got to keep showing up and shooting these videos because mm -hmm. I am trading my time for money. Then what I think you should do is start building out content and you're perfectly positioned to do it. You could review like, like right now in your office, like you could review that whatever microphone you got there. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could talk about your PC editing setup and you could talk about the gear you're using and the accessories you use, and you can connect it to affiliate marketing. You can leverage search on YouTube and you could create an extra income stream. Not only that, you could start building a brand and brand is incredibly valu valuable right now because mm -hmm. you get brand recognition. Look at Chase Jarvis. He's like a classic photographer. He's based in Seattle, started Creative Live and was doing photography work, but he's also built his personal brand. When you have a personal brand, you can leverage that into future things. Clients will pay you more. Um, you, uh, have more prestige, you'll, it'll lead to more work, but then it can also, what if you get injured? What if something happens? Well, now you've got a yeah. personal brand where you can move into more coaching mentorship. You definitely could do something like, I forget his name, but the guy that actually sells like a filmmaker course, it's like full-time filmmaker. That guy's killing it. That, oh that, yeah. Uh, right? Parker Walbeck. So, so he's, so Parker's doing the work, yeah. but he's also creating other streams. That's what every freelancer that isn't complaint you know or mm -hmm. isn't it, it doesn't want to just do what they're doing like if you love what you're doing cool but like that wants to potentially build for the future and create something else that's yeah. what i think uh you should absolutely do and that's the best model there and then yeah. you you know you also asked about business owners on the flip side you're using if you're a business owner then this is what i'm assuming about you you already have a sales process mm -hmm. you already have something to sell you already have like my friends to steve panette he uh, went through our course called Video Ranking Academy, mastered ranking videos. If you type in Phoenix, Arizona real estate, he's like one, two, or third spot there. Now, the mm. video that probably only has like 2,500, 3,000 views, but it's a couple years old. And right on top is his email and his phone number. So he doesn't need 100,000 views. He doesn't need to make 2% off cameras doing affiliate marketing, trying to do that at scale. He just needs one person to call him and to close a house. and then he could get that 2K commission, 5K commission, 10K commission. And that one video he made years ago. So business owners should be creating social media assets. And by the way, it's not just about YouTube. I mean, it's about Instagram, LinkedIn video right now, LinkedIn, um, wherever your target audience is, identifying that and then just using it to drive awareness to your business. It's pretty dang simple, actually, mm -hmm. because it's just, what is it you need? Well, I need qualified leads. All right. Where are they? Okay, great. Then that's where you'd want to reverse engineer your content strategy to have more of that happen. Like I want to get in front of the right people, add value, build no like, and trust, build goodwill. And then maybe they want to do business with me. And, uh, and you add more people in your pipeline. Man, that's fantastic. What, what do you think are some, I guess, some common mistakes that people make? With, with regards to, I guess, growing their business in general and or using video in their business? Um, I think that 
a couple things that uh, mistakes people make is the, probably the biggest one is just not doing it. You know, <laughs> a lot of people just don't do it. I get yeah. it. They're busy. Yeah. They got a lot of going on. Two, I think um, uh, a bit, huge common mistake is when it comes, okay, so number one, just not doing it. Mm -hmm. Number two is uh, not doing it consistently, consistently and for a long time. Like, you know, nothing, there's the, the 1% even started their business and had it like blow up effortlessly overnight. Any true entrepreneur filmmaker knows that they had to grind. I mean, I don't know about you. Like I, I did a lot of low paying jobs. I did a mm. lot of free work early on, early on. I was building my, my portfolio. Nothing is overnight. You know what I mean? Overnight success takes 10 years. Of course. So, but a lot of times in social media, it's hard for business owners to see far down the road. You see, you see the short-term energy you invested into it. Mm -hmm. You see the minimal results that came from it. So it's like you tried to upload videos to YouTube for three weeks. You tried being consistent on Instagram for like four days. Yeah. And yeah. then you're complaining and you're like, you know what? This stuff doesn't work. Nah, bro. You just didn't work it. Come on. And you didn't work it over a long enough period. And then on top of that, you then stage three. So the, first of all, they're not just doing it. Second of all, they're not doing it long enough. Stage three, then they're not doing it and actually learning how to do it well. Right. That's you've, you've seen this, man. We can speak right to this community. Like a lot of people think they're a filmmaker. There's so many people that think they're good at shooting video and editing. And a lot of, a lot of people reach out to me now, sometimes want to do like do work and you know, I'm not trying to be critical, but let's, we're talking shop, man. This is real talk. They send me stuff and I'm like, dude, that shot's frame bad. You clearly don't understand color grading or white balance. <laughs> Audio sketchy. Like yeah. there's not really like, maybe you don't even understand frame rate. Like, cause right. something's wrong with this video. Like it's just, it's not good. It's, it's very mediocre. It's very average. Yeah. And yeah. so the same is true about social. People just think that like, oh, cool. There's this thing called social media. I'm just going to jump on it and be, no, you're not going to be a master when you just jump on it. Mm -hmm. Of course, not. it's just like anything. Social media is like sports or filmmaking or accounting. Like some yeah. people, just because you, you, you know, a few financial terms doesn't know you, doesn't mean you really understand how to manage money, you know, manage and optimize for taxes yeah. you know, really plan for retirement. You need to know distinctions. Yeah. The mastery in any subject is based on the amount of distinctions you know about those subjects. So I'm actually really not a big numbers guy. I'm pretty smart with money now, obviously leading our company to multiple seven figures at some level, but I got experts around me to help me with that. And so it's like, you know, a, a, a mediocre or like a beginner newbie financial person understands maybe APR. They got a savings account. They got a checking account. Go talk to somebody on Wall Street. They're going to have 300 to 600 financial distinctions. Mm. They're going to know about puts, this, that. I'm making stuff up. They're going to know about yeah, stocks, yeah. the market. They're People that specialize in a very specific area. Yeah. And so in filmmaking, people's like, yeah. oh, yeah, I, I film, I shoot, I do, you know. It's yeah. like, okay, cool. But do you do you know all the way down to like, oh, yeah, like the bit rate of the file, yeah. how it's exported so it looks the yeah. best. You know, every you know, things about color yeah. grading and preserving images, ND filters, you know, like all these, yeah. things, <laughs> you know, get that blurry background in the sunlight. Like there's, and, and people listening that are masters, they're like, word up. I've, I, I know my yeah. distinctions. I've mastered my craft. Right. That's what I'd say about social is that there needs to be a commitment to, first of all, knowing that it is powerful, mm -hmm. knowing that you don't try and tell me it doesn't work. You just haven't worked it fully yet. It's proven mm -hmm. that it does. Yeah. You just have to put in the time and then be willing to, I think, commit to the process of experimenting, practicing, and then learning as you go. It's a skill to learn just like anything else. And you want to master the best practices and the distinctions for the relevant social media platforms for your business brand and the people you're trying to reach. Come on, man. I wish I could have you for like five hours to just continue to dissect your brain, man. Um, so th th that's a phenomenal content, man. Um, so man, I, I'm trying to figure out which thread to pull here and everything that you just said, um, man. And so one of the things that I've said and, and correct me if I'm wrong, right. And be, feel free to obviously give your input here. One of the things I've always had in my mind that sometimes I even, um, display it, 
uh, tell my clients oftentimes, you know, uh, bad video. I'm sorry. So, and, and I actually, cause it was a misunderstanding online. A lot of people kind of criticized me cause they misunderstood what I was trying to say. Um, I would, I would say like no video is better than bad, bad video, right? Coming from a filmmaking point of view, right? Um, talking to my clients, I feel like a bad video would bad. And what I mean by bad video, like just bad quality, right? Would really diminish the brand that you're trying to build, right? Do you think that maybe that holds some sort of weight or do you know, cause I know you mentioned earlier that just do it. It doesn't matter, you know, how you do it. But do you think that at some point the quality of the video would kind of hurt the brand of the, of the company? Like you can't have, um, uh, unless it's done on purpose, like Burger King putting out a, a, a commercial, but you obviously know that it was shot on a phone and they did that on purpose for social media purpose, whatever reason it was, it, it was the point of the story, you know, that they're trying to tell, but I'm talking like, this is all they have. So this is what they're going to do. You know, do you think at some point it's not a good idea to, to post a video or. I, I would actually lean more to no piece of content is actually really going to hurt your brand that bad. And, okay. and what I, what I would say is I think there's a place for both. I okay. think there's a place for highly produced. I think in fact, for almost any brand, there's a place for maybe having a sales video or a story video sure. um, or, or mini, mini documentary type of, or episodic mm -hmm. uh, high produced videos that tell your story. But in the exact same vein, and even maybe more important for getting started, it's like your iPhone vertically uh, having you rant even as you walk down the street yeah. about something that really matters to people and that is valuable content it is fine. More so is, is that more and more it's actually showing us uh we're seeing with stats and data that it's actually even working better than more produced and here's where i learned this the most i got a friend who runs um a company called pro church tools and my background is in the church space yeah. and so his name's brady Shear, and he was uh looking at some trends and some data and and so some churches actually have really strong creative departments and the team can get really romantic or the director can get really romantic about shooting flat and like making these beautiful videos mm -hmm. and some of them are shooting with reds and you know whatever and now they're in this sony's and they're trying to have like full sensor readout 4k you know whatever and and they they get into this thing and you can just get so romantic about stuff like mm -hmm. i think we need to be careful about falling in love with like our particular skill but getting out of touch with like what actually matters sure. and what it then ends up happening again so and, and maybe they bring the pastor in to teach like something and they sit him down and there's there's a slider shot and there's like you know bouquet behind him and oh my yeah. gosh and the audio is perfect and oh oh my the teal and the orange of that color grade and it's so <laughs> oh my goodness and, and you know what you drop you put all this energy into that content you drop it on youtube and it's it could just be kind of ghost town but then yeah. One day the, the pastor just grabs his phone, throws it in vertical mode. He's like, look, this is what's on my heart, man. And he just starts, he pours it out and it's the right content at the right time with the right title. And you throw like the right thumbnail on there. And then that video just catches, you know, kind of some virality and it gets 20,000 views. We're seeing more of that, I believe, than the other. And, 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 and by the way, it's both. It's not either or. Like the right sure. produced piece of content can go viral on Facebook, sure. but so can... Um, smartphone created stuff. I think that, so there's two sides. One, yeah. not only is smartphone enough, it could be better because yeah. I think there's also in culture, millennials for sure, but maybe all ages, we're just getting more and more ske skeptical and jaded by being sold to mm. or being like marketed to. And there's something about like, we just want real and raw authenticity, yeah. not as a gimmick, but you know, and, and if we even take it in the internet marketing space, I think it's important to love him or hate him. Uh, there's a guy named Ty Lopez who just kind of got famous for being like, I'm here in my garage with his iPhone. And oh, with he, a Ferrari or something and, like that. Yeah, it's the Ferraris and stuff. He's <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, I just bought these Ferraris, but that's not what I care about the most. It's my books, man. It's, it's all about books, knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. Right? And yeah. so, but what people don't realize is that from a business standpoint, Ty Lopez is worthy of study, even if you think you're yeah. not like the biggest fan. Because dude comes out of not nowhere. He had been doing stuff on the back end for years, yeah. but he came out with that video and it blew up. 
from two sides. It was kind of funny, kind of became a meme, but it also really built crazy amounts of business revenue. And he also put insane marketing dollars behind it. And so it, it was shot on his iPhone. He didn't even have a pop socket, man. He had to just pinch it between his two fingers and just, you know, hold it up. And, and it and I believe the views are something like over a hundred million total views. Gosh. And so that's the world we're living in. I think that day after day, I see documentary filmmakers, people that are trying to get their short film off the ground, and they've spent tons of money and time and their friends helped bootstrap it or they did whatever. And, and, and they're not, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not getting funded or they're not able to get it to the next phase. And, and why I think that is, is it's not that there isn't a place for all of that. It's that you haven't committed to creating content on your phone, getting over perfectionism and, and let, taking people behind the scenes and building an audience and, and adding value and building a tribe so that when you launch a project, people are already there. I think, so that's why it's both. I think that you yeah. can be working on produced projects, but I think you also need to be pumping out real raw organic content on Instagram stories just with your phone um, or, or like, which is like a vlog setup, you know, as well, that, that there's a mix of, of all the content formats that are an opportunity for people. Man, that's awesome. And you're definitely preaching to me there because I'm one of those like quote unquote perfectionists that I'll, I'll delay a project if I don't have the right tool. Right. And um, it, it, it's so funny because I started my freelance filmmaking career in 2013. That's when I January 2013. I'll never forget just because it's January uh, 2013. And so um, and I've always I started I didn't even have a camera when I started. I was borrowing a camera and that's how I started and just making videos for for, uh, you know, for free, just like many people start making videos for free, borrowing gear. And, uh, um, and I've always said, you know, I, if I can get this camera, I, I can really make some good stuff. If I can get this microphone, that audio is going to be better. If I can get these lights, everything's just going to be so much better. And here I am. Um, and, and I like to do my own, you know, passion projects, but here I am five cameras in right. Five cameras that I would never even dreamt of that I would be able to buy the lights, the uh, microphone. I have six, my seven microphones, lavalier, seven lavaliers, three shotgun. Like I have basically everything I needed and, and still I'm trying to get more perfect, you know? And I, I think, and, and this is something that I'm just always trying to battle on my own and, and making my own personal passion projects, the things that I love to do, like documentaries, the way I just want to put that stuff out there. Because believe it or not, that stuff, I, I made my um, my recent uh, passion project called Zion. I've gotten some great work simply because my clients have seen Zion, you know, that's and awesome. that's the result of that and uh, th things like that. So I want to continue to make more passion projects just like that because that's the kind of work that I like to do. But yeah, I'm right there in, the, in that category of people that just want everything to be perfect and it's a constant battle all the time you know trying to overcome that and just do it with what i have you know well and this might not be you but there's really two things i mean i can completely relate because sure. i got all this gear when i started my business i took out a loan actually and it was the dslr revolution was starting mm. um and i got a canon 7d and at that time i bought philip bloom's dvd on how to use it i paid him you know it was like 300 bucks and then I was like, I was learning about like the 180 degree shutter rule. Plus he had me on like getting Zacuto rigs for it and stuff. And that's when I was getting my ND filters and whatever. And so what happened though was on the one hand, yes, I think there's a perfectionism thing that um, I was always like, oh, but I, oh shoot, like I just saw that scene he shot, man, the lens he has, I mean, it looks so good. I need to wait until I get that lens until I shoot a video. Um, and so I could totally, I think a lot of people go through that. We always think our next piece of gear, or the next thing is going to be the thing that'll unlock it for us. But I think the other big thing and not saying that you, this is a thing for you, but I think mm -hmm. for a lot of us, I know it's for me is actually, it's really fear. Like yeah. we're actually hiding behind. It's that apprehension more about, do I really feel ready to share my voice or what are people mm -hmm. going to think? And it's just kind of making an excuse. I remember, oh, you know, totally. let me order that lens on off eBay. Cause I'm always trying to hustle and find like a deal yeah. and I'll wait and then I'll shoot that video in two weeks. And <laughs> my thing is actually would be this order the lens, but also shoot the video right now. Like don't mm -hmm. wait for the lens 
Come on. And, and keep pumping out that consistent content um, because we're always going to, there's always going to be another tool or another thing to buy. But a lot of times those are just maybe fear, perfectionism. And, um, and the other thing is actually this truth that's true for all of us as creatives that actually creativity works best in constraints. Mm. I've sometimes seen that, you know, my house is the same, man, or, you know, I got, I got cameras and all, you know, you all this <laughs> different gear, microphones Yeah. that sometimes like too much leads to overwhelm. Yeah. That, that there's been times where I, I just went to Austin, Texas and uh, I, I, I built out this vlogging setup to go there. And on the video here, I'm holding it up. It's like, I got a, my Sigma lens and I had to get this hot shoe relocation plate on my Sony a6400 to move my sure lens hopper to the side. And I got the Joby <laughs> mic and, I, and then I was bringing a fader ND with it. So I could all the stuff. And, and, and even it was taking me like, I was going around the house trying to get all the gear and get it ready and put in my bag, all these extra batteries. And there's something about just grabbing a Canon uh, G7 X Mark II, mm -hmm. one camera, one point and shoot, two batteries, throw an SD card in there that's big enough to shoot for a week. And that's your only tool. And the stuff you can make with it's amazing because creativity works best in constraints. Sometimes if there's too many options, too oh. many lenses, too many things, it leads us to kind of paralysis and, and even complexity. Look, complexity um, leads to overwhelm. Simplicity mm -hmm. kills overwhelm. So sometimes we, I think we just need to discipline ourselves down and just say, what if I only had this? Like, what if I just had this tool? And sometimes our most interesting and creative work uh, can come out when we don't have access to everything, but when we almost limit our tools and see what we can do with something. Wow. Come on, man. I got so many sound bites off of this. <laughs> That's a good one, man. Um, no, you just killed it with that one. That That is so true that having too many too many options would really kind of hold you back, right? I've done so much work. I have that. Uh, I don't know what camera you had there. I, it looked like the A6400. Yeah, A6400. Yeah, so I have the A6300. I love that was the first camera I've ever bought. I love that camera, and I it's paid itself off like tenfold, a hundredfold. I would even say. Um, even today, I could still. I don't really use it too much except for as my webcam here, but. I could easily grab that camera and still go and do paid work with it. For sure. Right? I didn't need to pay $5,000 for the FS5, another $7,000 for the FS7, the other uh, $2,000 for the GH5. I could have done all that stuff well, for except the FS7 because that one is like specific people ask for it. But I could have done everything else with <laughs> just the A6300. And yeah, there's just so many options. Um, it, it in in my in my defense, it, it does help. I, I I purchase for convenience, but it's just a convenience. You know what I mean? So yeah, I can easily do the work uh, with everything else I had. But I'm like, all right, let me just make it easier. Let's let's buy that cage. Let's get that attachment that you had to put the microphone on the side. Um, and that's and that's really wise. I mean, on the flip side too, there are some projects that demand certain tools. So like. Sure. When we're at, when we're shooting our our conference, for example, and we have uh, mm -hmm. our team will be helping in shooting that, you know, there's gonna be low light situations. We gotta have good glass out there, man. Mm -hmm. We want the super crispy. Not only that, we uh, we're gonna be filming from a video production standpoint all of the sessions at our conference coming up in September 14th, and so we're doing a 6400s. We're doing um, they have no record limit, and so we can hit right? it up. I know that. We can hit them up in 4K, face tracking, I think eye tracking. Um, and I got the 70 to 200 2.8. We're going to probably rent one, but I bought one so that we can get that crispy shot from back of the room and use it for the events we shoot. And I mean, that lens is just stupid. I mean, it's 2300 yeah. bucks or something. But I was like, yeah, like that goes beyond your phone and whatever. Yeah, totally. Like, but it's, it's, the it's the right tool for... Sure. Uh, for the event and, and and then there's things we want to you know if you want slow motion although iphones can do some gnarly slow motion but yeah. same thing low light lenses so so it's it's if the storytelling and the project demands something you mentioned some clients they want the fs7 of course like yeah. makes sense but I, that just speaks to i think the fact that some of us could probably even especially when it comes to social media because i think yeah. for filmmakers you've got all this stuff that you're so used to using that's a little more fancy over here and it's it's a hard jump to actually just be okay 
creating content on your phone that doesn't live up to this. And you sometimes think that this will be a reflection on that. That's not true. Yeah. Your, 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 your documentary that's out, the thing that's, you know, that's, that's, that's why I think both is what's powerful. People sure. see you crushing it, putting out insane production value content, and then they are able to relate with you by yeah. just on the shaky phone footage of you just kind of sharing some tips or taking people behind the scenes. Gotcha. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, needless to say that my scope of work is completely different. Like I'm selling quality to my clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they fully expect that, you know, but on the other hand, like for me, as for me, for social media, I, I do post a lot. I post mostly BTS stuff, the gear that I'm using, things like that as more as a reminder. And I, I've gotten, you know, a handful of jobs off social media. But for me, it's never really the purpose of me posting it. But obviously, I'm not going to say no. But you know, and I, I went through a small phase where I wanted all my shots to be shot on, on my camera. If it's not the A6300 or better, I don't want to even post it until I started seeing it's like, all right, this is getting too much of a hassle. You know, my phone takes fantastic pictures. Um, so, and even that, the ever since they, they, they rolled out with the, uh, what's it called? The portrait mode. And it just gets yeah. better and you get some nice crispy uh shallow yeah, depth crispy. images and whatnot. So yeah, I mean I it's just all about and now like the the my iPhone X, the Max and whatnot. Now you can shoot raw uh on photos uh through the Lightroom app and whatnot. And Dang. uh I didn't even know that. Yeah, man. I so I, I keep the Lightroom app on my main on my main screen, and when I hard press it, I just hit the camera icon and pops up the camera right away and it those are dng files you can you have that flexibility to really if if it's a high dynamic range situation yeah i, I have to pull that out to kind of bring that stuff back you know and that's just awesome though to just to like dial in the white balance perfect oh yeah oh no, totally you have a lot more flexibility but yeah you know, when you're outdoors it really doesn't matter the image is going to be really really nice but if uh yeah if you just want a little bit more control and i usually do it that way um and it's very nice. You're, you're editing a raw photo in, on your phone. Um, it'll be a while before they come out with video, raw video <laughs> from your from your iPhone. That's going to be a while. Uh, my goodness. Um, so just putting out content like that, um, I don't know. I feel like, like I said a second ago, like it's definitely different for me than it is for regular business owners, you know? So like, yeah, because of your skills too, and because of your experience. Because it maybe a regular business owner, video is entirely new to them, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to it's kind of your native language. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's definitely a huge one there. What are some other like? And you had mentioned one of the mistakes that people make is not making enough video or thinking that. What about thinking that they don't need video? Are there some? instances where a business may not need video is there a business like that i mean of course like this I, this is this, i tell people this all the time like if things are great for you and you've got all the money you want and all the customers you want and the lifestyle you want and the business you want why change anything mm -hmm. now there is wisdom to change it because just because it's good today you need to dig your well before you're thirsty but I really mean that like it's it's like if things are working because here's here another good example. Mm -hmm. I see so there's so much opportunity right now, meaning I'm killing it on YouTube, but I really see the value in starting a podcast and I want to start one and I'm struggling with bandwidth and I'm fighting perfectionism <laughs> and and I'm like, oh, but I want it to be this way because it's going to be this standard and I'm making excuses. Mm. So that's me limiting my upside by overthinking it and not, if you will building my brand even bigger or going deeper and adding more value to our community by not stepping into that arena. Same thing's true for the business owner. If what you're, cause what's what I'm doing right now is working. So if they're like, what sure. you're doing is working, then they don't necessarily need to do anything else. But I think the, the big thing to think about is just cause it's working today doesn't mean it'll be working tomorrow. There's a, you know, biblical story of Joseph and the, you know, seven years of, of prosperity and seven years of famine. And yeah. he, prepared for the seven years of famine and things were fine because he stored up grain. He got ready for a rainy day. And I think business owners need to be looking ahead. Just, yeah, you not using video today might be fine, but mm -hmm. will it be fine five years from now? And things you need to be aware of. 
you might not want to use video today, but guess what? Your competitors already are. So are you willing to give up market share? Well, maybe your current customer base is fine. So, I mean, but just things you should think about, like, totally. are you willing to be put out of business in five years? You know, taxi cab drivers um, did not, and limo drivers didn't really see Uber coming. And then it was here. So I think there's something about preparing and positioning yourself and planning ahead. Furthermore, I think there's also, when you say using online video, I think that there's different levels to use it. I think there's like five videos every business should have eventually that are just done and on their website and working for them. Like probably a sales video of your core offer. Like video is the best way to sell something, be it, be it like physical goods, merch, clothing. When you study it out, consumers that are researching products want video content more than ever before when they're shopping online. So, so like it could be uh, a sales video for your products, a story video, you know, a, a little quick telling your story. And I'm not talking about like a hour long film. I'm talking about tell your story in like 90 seconds to like a minute and uh, two and a half minutes. And that's like right there on your website. So people can know, like, and trust you, but also ultimately see what you could do for them. So like pieces like that are, are ways to use video. I think the next piece would be a video ad. I just spoke at San Diego University to the tourism authority. And I, I talked about three ways to start using YouTube if you're in business. The first one is YouTube ads. You don't even need to like be a YouTube content creator. You need one video. You put out one video, you put money behind it. That one video leads to customers and sales and you just keep spending money. And if you're making more than you're spending, then why would you not do that? Mm. So you only need one video. You just need to hire Ariel to make you one marketing video. <laughs> and then you just start running ads behind that on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and you're in the game. Look at Purple Mattress and watch how oh, they wow. blew up their brand by, by putting out these kind of viral videos that not just got organic sharing, but they put a ton of money behind those suckers. And so you could just put out their YouTube channel gets 20 million views a month not because of their subscribers. It's because they're just cranking money behind stuff, but it's selling mattresses. So right. YouTube ads. Secondly, you can jump into YouTube with influencers. You don't necessarily have to be the content. You have a business. Why don't you look in your city? Look at micro influencers. Give them like a free meal and let them come down and, 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 and check it out. Not because them posting it on their Instagram or their YouTube channel maybe is going to blow up your business. Influencers are amazing because they are basically video production independent video production houses, right? They know how to create content. Plus they might create it vloggy style and raw and relatable. So them creating a piece of content for your business, if it's aligned and then you getting the rights to use it, now you could upload that on your channel or use, you could even put ads behind that. You know, my friends, Alejandro Reyes, um, he's got two daughters, um, you know, Hispanic Mexican family, and they had 30,000 YouTube subscribers, which is a lot, but that's micro influencer by definition is like 35,000, uh, 30,000 subscribers or less. Right. And they did six figures in one year in brand deals, working with target, working with dove, working with different people. Why? Well, mainly because of the ethnicity and mm -hmm. what they wanted was they actually, it, it wasn't that the video uploaded on their channel was going to blow up. It was them in the video. They were a YouTubing family them doing in some content that they could create and that the brand was interested. Does that make sense? So yeah, then the second yeah. level is you could work with influencers and you're not even creating content yourself. And then the third is actually saying, I'm going to start a basically media company. I'm going to start a YouTube channel of content that's going out with the intent of building my brand awareness following so that I don't just have customers today, but I have customers for life as I build a tribe in a movement and that's a commitment to creating content. And whether you get someone on your team to do it, you do it yourself, you um, you know, you work with other influencers and other guests. You can look at like Expedia, you know, travel software and online. They don't have like a, a face of their brand. They have a 360 video that was well made of of touring through Australia. And then they have like Disneyland, some dude with two stormtroopers next to him that like works at the park and he's shooting. So, so they just are doing all kinds of different content, but their YouTube channel organically is doing great. It's growing by mm -hmm. like thousands of subscribers a month. And so there's just different ways to get into the game as a business owner, whether that's with YouTube ads, 
in one video, whether that's leveraging and connecting with influencers to use their influence or to help them create content for you or making a commitment at some level to creating content on a consistent base, basis for your business, not just for like the short-term ROI as if that's going to increase sales immediately, but no, it's for the long-term brand because having a YouTube subscriber, uh, a channel with 5,000 subs, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 is a big deal. We're not talking about energy invested today that's just like, oh, I got to start over tomorrow. We're talking about real momentum. We're talking about like something that's truly priceless, a fan base, right. a base of raving fans and people that can roll with you for life. You're in a great position and now you're not at the mercy of the latest advertising trick or, or because the Amazon ads that you run to your products stopped working or are too expensive now. You're really doing both. Not just direct response, but also building real brand. That's fantastic. That's really, really good stuff. Not that long ago, you had posted um, a video that I found very interesting on on Instagram. It was, I think, you had said that it was your first video that you ever uploaded when you tried to when you were when you were getting into video. Yeah. Um, and then you contrasted it with the videos that you're making now. And I, I guess what you were pointing out is like, nobody starts awesome. You know, like obviously you had a starting point. I had a starting point when we started. Uh, if you go back and look at my first episode, especially the first episode that I posted, it looks nothing like what it looks like right now. Um, and I obviously the goal is to make it better, but um, things like that. Do, do you feel like uh, that is obviously a roadblock for people when they want to continue making content? They just want to make it, like they want to probably start like this here. You know, they want to start to where you're at now rather than just starting in general. Oh, it's a huge roadblock and it's illogical. And here's why. I mean, you have to accept the fact that your first videos will be your worst videos. And yeah. like, that's going to be surprising. Your first anything is your worst. Like nobody starts good at any, anything. So a huge mistake people make is they compare their beginning to somebody else's middle. And I kind of think about it like going to the gym, which is not a place that I go. So, but I've, I've been there like one time. And so, I mean, clearly, right. Like, I, like the reason you the gun, I mean, you got the guns. I mean, it looks like you've been, but like me, I got little old strong arms over here, <laughs> but the one time I walked into the gym, you know, it, it, it sucks. And, and the reason it sucks is because you walk in and you're like, dude, I mean, I don't even have any workout clothes, man. I got holes in these freaking sweatpants. You walk in, I don't recognize anybody. I feel awkward. People must know it's my first time. Obviously, I'm out of shape. I'm scrawny, whatever. Everyone's staring uh, at me. <laughs> everyone's staring at you. And then you go up, and then I walk to the machines. I don't even know how to use them, right? There's like a picture on it. I'm like, doing, I'm like, oh, frick, I turned around the wrong way. Like, okay, which way is the guy doing? Like, which one do you do? Well, because the first time you walk into the gym is your worst time, right? It's scary. You don't have the right clothes. You don't have the right form. You don't even have foundational muscles to like do the form right. You don't have any skills. You don't have any training. It's the same thing as video. It's the same thing as anything. And then though, what happens? You keep showing up. You mm. keep putting in the reps. The muscles get bigger. You keep putting in the reps. You keep meeting other people. And then someone's like, oh yeah, let me help you. I'm gonna spot you. Now you're rolling in. You're like, oh, what up, Brad? You're like fist bump. You're like, hey, lady. you know, now you like know people. You're wearing like some kind of headband. You got like a gym shark shirt on. So now you're like wearing the right clothes. You're getting, you're like more ripped. Why? Because you kept showing up. You kept putting in the reps. You kept, and this video is the same way. You yeah. got to punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face, press record, and then keep pressing record because over time you will get better. I've uploaded over 2000 videos online and probably the first 1600 of those just weren't that good. Mm. I'm here because I've just put in a freakish amount of reps right. when it comes to this stuff. And, and by the way, that first video you saw wasn't even close to my first video. That was my first youtube video on my personal channel <laughs> so whenever I, you got the courage to upload something that's what we saw there <laughs> no straight up i started video in 2003 volunteering for the youth group uh, at my church in my small town okay. making weekly video announcements that played every wednesday night and true story i shot these on a canon hv30 with mini dv tapes oh wow fire wire I would shoot all the footage, capture minute for minute into Adobe Premiere. First time I ever opened it, no education, no one helping me, no YouTube. YouTube didn't even exist yet. It's 2003. It didn't start till 2007. 
I open it up and I and I get it says create a project and I'm like, what is NTSC and PAL? Oh man, there are all these options, 24 or oh, 25 man. or 30 or 20, whatever, you know, 24 or 30, and I just pick one and I and I pick PAL because it oh. sounded more friendly. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Come I was on. like, what's NT PAL? Like, I want a PAL. And so for like three months on our freaking youth group videos, the motion was all jaggedy and wrong because we're playing it. And so yeah. what we do is I would edit up this footage. I would then finish the video, capture it minute for minute back to a mini DV tape. And then I would put that tape in a VHS converter. And then we had a, a VCR plugged into our projector for Wednesday night youth group, plug that in on announcements. Someone would be like, all right, check out the remix, which was our re that's what we called it. And someone would hit play on the VCR and it would play my 10 minute announcement video at youth group. What's my point? I was doing that in 2003. And then on top of that, because I was like in church, it was a great place to be. I was, I was going through like how to communicate, how to like preach a sermon, how to structure a teaching. And so I was putting in the reps and the education. People are like, you know what? I just don't have what it takes to get on video or, or communicate effectively. No, sure you do. And that's not to d diminish that there's people are b b born with certain natural talents, but people have no clue the amount of time, repetition, practice, coaching. Mm. I was buying communication CDs off eBay in like 2007 and I got this like 12 box and I was listening because I was like trying to get better as a communicator, which is ultimately what we're talking about. This right. all comes down to communication. True. You're a communicator. You're a visual yeah. storyteller. There you go. People on social media, you got to be a storyteller. You got to be a, communi a communicator. And those skills, like even sometimes I know there's actually good communicators in their business. They'll get up and teach or do a seminar or share a deck with a client. They're just a little bit intimidated with video. Look, you'll get past that punch fear in the face, just kind of get used to like talking to a camera mm -hmm. and because you already got the skills, but all of us need to level up as communicators, yes. how, how to be influential, persuasive storytellers. Those are the raw skills that yeah. matter in social media. The technical side is learnable. Anybody can learn it. Like of the course. technical, like that's only probably though 20% of it. 80% is actually the message, the content, the substance, mm. the delivery, like just making sure you're, it's not even really a right or wrong style. You just want to be pouring out from your heart, from your, yeah. like something that's authentic, something that is understandable, something that's clear, something that's yours, something that's real. Um, you know, something that's not, you don't want to be an echo. You want to be a voice. Come you were on. born an original. Don't die a copy. Like your <laughs> message, like your uh, you know, story being shared, that's where the magic is. You can learn the tech stuff and practice over time. But I think uh, really investing and leveling up as a communicator is, and, and here's the thing, people might say, well, if I start investing in social media right now, what if it, what if, you know, all this effort doesn't pay off in two years because YouTube goes away? That's, don't even worry about that because everything you'll learn Number one, you could build audience now, build impact now, drive sales now, but you could, but everything you learn is going to get you ready for YouTube hologram affic, YouTube holographic Whatever platform. You, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it'll get you ready. Cause if you don't start t telling your story and learning how to communicate on modern tools now, you're definitely not going to be yeah. positioned to maximize when we are in the freaking Star Trek holodeck and you need to know how, you know, I don't know, whatever's next. Maybe VR, VR, yeah. all that stuff, man. That's, that is so true. That is so true. And that's something I actually wanted to touch on that last part. The, the, the whole storytelling aspect of it um, when it comes to videos like Ty Lopez's video that he posted and it went viral and things like that. It's the story that really captures people. And, and I got, I got to be honest for the past couple of years, I feel like that's what I've been really honing in on and trying to focus on more um, is the storytelling aspect of my work. And I, I I've spent the last many, many years, growing my gear, getting the best everything. Now, you know, I, I can continue doing that, but it's not going to make my work better unless I learn how to tell that story better, you know? And that's what I'm really starting to realize now. And even reading books on whatnot and what makes good storytelling and in everything, there's a story, you know, whether it's a, a blatant advertising video, you know, like the, the purple mattress, these people, they're telling a story. And I think that that's, what's capturing people. You know? Anyone that's winning is.
there's a lot of people that aren't that are losing. So that's one thing you mentioned that tie video again, even though it was just shot on a phone, he's a very smart marketer mm. and he knew exactly what he was doing, you know, cause I'm sure it, now I'm not saying it was even necessarily massively premeditated, but in my opinion, it probably was. He mm. thought, you know, I heard the story once he spoke at a marketing conference I was at and he was like, I came home, I had some bookshelves installed in the garage and I got an idea. I was like, you know, I was like, I'm here in my garage, but he was like, you know, this is where I park my cars. But what I like the most is the books. But here's what he'd been studying. He'd been studying marketing, communication, persuasion, copywriting, how to, um, you know, he'd been he'd been writing copy and doing sales and marketing for in the online space and the dating space for like a decade. He was doing Google AdWords marketing stuff early 2000s. So when he shows up out of nowhere, it's the same idea. It's, it's true for anybody. Overnight success is never overnight. Mm. Overnight success takes 10 years. So then it's like this little video comes out on his phone, but the messaging, I'm not, it's, it wasn't scripted, but he had been honing his skills of, of how to put together like this leads to that leads to that leads to this. Right. Um, when it comes to putting together a basically marketing or communication message, cause he used it as an ad. Um, there's, there's classic books people should read. Scientific advertising is one, um, the, like with the wizard of ads, like when you get into this space and then by the way, it's interesting. I would say that in, in my opinion, the future for filmmakers and freelancers, maybe mainly, maybe more freelancers and freelance videographers less than film, but is, I think learning both. I think that at some level filmmaking and good shooting and good editing is going to get commoditized mm -hmm. and it's the people that can do both creative and strategy oh, people yeah. that are not just thinking about a great world-class video, but how it exists, lives and is distributed within these social media platforms and contexts. Yeah. You know, it's not the one-off project anymore. It's like, yeah, we're not just going to make this core video for you, but we're also going to give you the micro pieces of content that can be distributed across LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we're going to give you, um, you know, behind the scenes or this or that, or we're going to give you, lead-ins and, and and things that could be used as facebook ads like and then people that bring that cohesive strategy and the execution of all the above are definitely going to be the new era filmmakers yeah. that i think build massive businesses and kind of redefine the industry that's been phenomenal um i posted the other day uh about the ronin se s sc that dji just came out with and I just got thinking. Um, did Did you see that gimbal? That new Ronin? Um, oh yeah, I haven't I haven't uh, researched it, was, it yet, but I saw it, it everywhere. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Um, and then it just got me thinking, and I posted it. Like, it's never been a better time to be a filmmaker or to to just be a content creator in general. Like, all the tools are right there. These are tools that have never, like, in the past, you would not be able to to get this stuff when you were working with VHS tapes. Like, to get tools that we have today. At the price point that they have them at today it's oh ridiculous. yeah are you kidding me i mean you just throw a freaking dual pixel autofocus canon camera on there and and tap someone's face with a lav mic and then just walk backwards and it's perfectly smooth as they're walking down the pathway and it's perfectly in focus i know you know like bro we were people are like does it have autofocus though we didn't have autofocus in video <laughs> man <laughs> we were, I was putting like a little balloon or like a stuffed animal and like trying to get myself in focus and then like sitting down, yeah. you know, and now Sony's got 2050 billion autofocus points edge to edge on your sensor. eye tracking dog, the new a seven R four. Oh my and, like, God. Do like eye tracking on dogs or whatever oh, yeah, I and saw eye tracking that. In video, <laughs> uh, but you're, you're totally right. Like, and I also, I also agree. I think that, um, Filmmakers in general and video content producers, if, mm -hmm. if you if they're good, will 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 not struggle to get work. Oh yeah, because everybody right now is understanding businesses. They want to hire you. Yeah. Um, you know, Gary Vee made it popular to get a D Rock. Like every on, and there's a lot of them, man. There's a lot of successful entrepreneurs that have a lot of money yeah. that love Gary Vee and that want their own D Rock. You know what? Actually, a good business model is is figure out like. D rocks, no joke. So like level up your skills to be able to deliver, um, something similar to an entrepreneur and bro, you can, you can get 
paid. You can get work. I, I, there's so much opportunity right now oh, to man. be a content creator, videographer. It's it's pretty much endless. Yeah. And it's not shrinking. It's just growing. It's growing. And I feel like it's up to you guys. If, you, if you're not making it, it's because you're not either passionate about it or whatnot, like the stuff is there for you. And I, I think, again, it's just, it's never been a better time to do that. Even with phones, you know, just and I think you got to shorten your learning curve, but you got to put in the time, you know, Malcolm Gladwell in the book out Lear's massively quoted kind of was highlighting the 10,000 hour rule that it takes 10,000 hours to develop mastery in your subject. And so there also sometimes is just no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. It's faster now because you have unlimited tutorials and mentors and, and tools and all of those things are great, but at some time you got to just buckle down and do the work. That's the deal. It's like the, the greats of any industry of any arena they've put, they've, they're prolific. They've done mm -hmm. the outputs. Like you said, you, you were shooting videos years ago that weren't good. The reason your videos are good today are for a lot of reasons, but it's also because you've just put in so many outputs, man. Yep. You've yep. had the time and the outputs. And so, yep. you know, it, it, it's, it can be daunting too, because you just are never going to be at a mastery level overnight, but the best time to start and go all mm -hmm. in is now. And meaning I, I don't want to just work on my craft one hour a month because it's going to take me a hundred years to develop any kind of mastery. How right. can you increase the intensity of your learning? You know, what happens to people when they join the military and they go into intense forms of training of it, like they level up fast oh, yeah. because of the intensity, because of the immersion. Yeah. I think that it's very possible to develop uh, high levels of skill, but you got to block time, punt, maybe leisure, you know, uh, if, especially if you love it and just get obsessed oh, and just go all in. Again, I think back to 2010, dude, I was just watching videos up all night, reading forums, yeah. trying, to figure, trying to solve problems, trying to figure out why stupid video wasn't exporting and why it kept right. crashing, yeah. you know, just like really clocking time. And, and I think that's the opportunity like is, is, is to there's unlimited resources for learning. And mm -hmm. there's unlimited opportunities, in my opinion, to do pro bono work, free work. Oh, there's, yeah. there's unlimited ways to build your portfolio. And if you learn massively, you know, really lifelong leaders or lifelong learners, and you build your portfolio, those are the two things I want to see too. Too many, it's crazy. People reach out to me to do film work. And I'm like, cool, man, just send me your channel or send me your portfolio. And they, they don't have one. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what are you even reaching out for? Like that is... <laughs> That is your resume as a filmmaker. On, like if you don't have a portfolio yet, go build one. Yeah. And 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 that's maybe why I'm saying no. So, but there's maybe somebody that would just say, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll let yeah. you go shoot a video for me or cover my conference, you know, or cover my, you know, cover this leadership event and shoot a little recap video or whatever, or just make it up on your own. We started a project called Think International in 2010 as well with my friend. We weren't paid to do it. It was pure passion project. We mm -hmm. were actually interviewing faith-based faith leaders at conferences, shooting some different behind the scenes. We go on these little mini tours in LA. Outputs, uploaded like 250 videos on that channel. And it actually led to me getting a job as a creative director at a like a 3,000 person church in Las Vegas. And when he said, have you ever been a creative director at any kind of large? I said, no. Um, but check out this channel that has 10,000 subscribers and 250 videos and all this kind of stuff. He goes, all right. Well, you have something to show. You built something. There's yeah. something that has proven results. If you've done that there, then I can trust you that you'd be able to do this here. So yeah, man, do the work, clock those 10,000 hours, level up your skills. And, uh, I think the possibilities are endless. Man. So good, man. So good. Where can people find you? What are all the links? I know you have several different, uh, handles and websites and whatnot what are some of, I'm, I'm also going to link it obviously in the show notes for this episode but if you want to just uh throw some out there yeah i mean i think uh the first thing if anybody wants to learn youtube the book youtube secrets uh, mm. is out you know that's on all the amazon's um you know ebooks like 4.99 and so amazon canada amazon uk here in the u.s audiobook physical book if you want youtube that it's a great primer uh all the strategies you need and then just go for it uh, and then the two channels are, if you go to YouTube search, just type in the word think space media, that'll take you to our channel. Think media. If you're interested in accessories for your smartphone to level up your AVL a little bit, cameras, some of the stuff we recommend for creators, um, as well as a lot of strategies. And then we have a weekly interview show called on our video influencers channel 
that people could check out. Type in the word video space influencers, ERS on the end there, video influencers. And that is um, a weekly interview show from both. I love this. Entrepreneurs using video and YouTubers using video. And here's why. Entrepreneurs need to learn from YouTubers because they are the ones that understand the algorithm, are getting the views, understand thumbnails, are growing their channels. And yeah. entrepreneurs need that to grow their businesses. On the flip side, YouTubers need to learn from entrepreneurs because they don't know how to build a real business. They don't know how to like scale, build a team, actually build a real business. They're focusing on ads. They're doing too many brand deals and they just have bosses and they're, you know, like meaning they have too many clients to serve and they and they maybe aren't building an empire like a business owner is. And that was our heart was to combine those two world worlds. So it's a weekly interview show from people on both sides so we can master video, level up and ultimately build our influence, income and impact faster as creative entrepreneurs. Wow. Where, and where, where is that? I definitely want to check that one out. Video influencers, video space oh. influencers on YouTube. Yeah. Awesome. Weekly I'm going to interview show. Yeah. I'm going to grab all those links and it'll be on the show notes for this episode over on the iFilmmaker.tv website. Sean Cannell, thanks so much for passing by and just dropping so many knowledge bombs on us. Um, it was great having you here on the show, man. Appreciate you, Ariel. Thanks for having me on and love what you're doing and how you're helping people. Awesome. Thanks, man.